പരാത്മാനമേക ജഗദ്ബീജമാദ്യം നിരീഹം നിരാകാരമോങ്കാരവേദ്യം യത്തെ പാല്യത്തേന വിശ്വം തമീഷം ഭജേലീയത്തെ യത്ര വിശ്വം ഹരിയോം തത്സത് ഹരിയോം തത്സത് ഹരിയോം തത്സത് സോ ഡിയർ ഡിവോട്ടീസ് today we shall commence the study of the 15th chapter of shrimad bhagavad gita <clears throat> this 15th chapter is uh, in a way a very important chapter as such we can't say that one chapter is more important and others are less important but the 15th chapter has got its own speciality so understand to understand the speciality of this 15th chapter i shall start from the last verse of this chapter 15th chapter the 15th chapter of bhagavad gita has got only 20 verses it is the smallest among all the 18 chapters of bhagavad gita 15th chapter as well as the 12th chapter both these chapters have got just 20 verses but in spite of that there is something very special about the 15th chapter what is the speciality of this 15th chapter let us try to understand that whatever i shall be uh saying in course of this class i shall be following bhagwan shri shankaracharya's commentary on shri krishna's great teaching we should remember that when we are talking about hindu dharma this i always emphasize the point everyone should understand this point hindu dharma is essentially the vedic dharma it is the vedas the vedas which is almost which is infinite ananta gyana rashi ananta shabda rashi there is nothing outside of the vedas and of this vedas shri krishna's bhagavad gita is considered to be the greatest commentary if you understand bhagwan shri krishna's bhagavad gita we are understanding the very essence of what the vedas have to teach this is the point and amongst all the commentaries that we have on bhagavad gita bhagwan shankaracharya's commentary is considered to be the greatest swami vivekananda says about this commentary that the greatest work with this great spiritual master did during his small lifetime he just lived for 32 years and what he accomplished is something mind boggling so the greatest work vivekananda says that shankaracharya did was that he wrote this masterly commentary on shrimad bhagavad gita it is said that after shankaracharya only bhagavad gita became popular in india before that it was not popular it was existing from time to past from dwapar yuga it was existing but it is shankaracharya's commentary which made bhagavad gita popular throughout india and even today it is considered to be the greatest commentary on shri krishna which itself is the best commentary on the vedas so that is the connection the vedas shri krishna shankaracharya 
and coming down to Sri Ramakrishna. Just now the beautiful chanting which was done by Kavishananda Ji, I was listening in my room. All the description that you find about Sri Ramakrishna, everything that we are going to study in this chapter, you will find Sri Ramakrishna is the best demonstration of that. A complete and a total demonstration of what our Shastras teach. That is what we find in Sri Ramakrishna's life. Beautiful. You want to see the living demonstration? You can look at Sri Ramakrishna's life through the lens of the scriptures, through the lens of the Upanishads, through the lens of Bhagavad Gita, and through the lens of Shankaracharya's immortal words. You will see that everything gets demonstrated in this great life of Sri Ramakrishna. So in this 15th chapter, whatever we are going to study now, you, f you can just keep the image of Sri Ramakrishna in front. You can remember, you can try to recollect all the incidents from Sri Ramakrishna's life, which literally speaking reflects these great ideas which Sri Krishna and Shankaracharya in his commentary places before all of us. So, what is the speciality of this 15th chapter? That is the first thing. So, those who have books, they can just go to the 20th verse of the 15th chapter. I am starting from the last verse. Instead of starting from the first verse, let us go to the last verse of Bhagavad Gita, 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. In the last verse, Commenting upon this last verse, Shankaracharya says, What do we find in this chapter? Asmanadhyaye Bhagavat Tattva Gyanam Moksha Falam Uktva. Two things, beautiful things. He says in this 15th chapter, Bhagavat Tattva Gyanam has been uttered or told by Sri Krishna. This Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam is a very important term. The Tattva Jnanam about Bhagavan. See, in our literature, we often come across different terms. Bhagavat Prapti, Bhagavan, Lab, Ishwar Lab, all these different terms you will come across in our books, even in Kathamrita also will come across. What is the meaning of this Bhagavat Prapti or Ishwar Lab? It actually means Bhagavan's Tattva Jnanam, Ishwara's Tattva Jnanam, Ishwara as Ishwara is, and not the Ishwara of our imaginations. Not God of our imaginations, but God as God is. So this is what Krishna has given to us throughout the Bhagavad Gita, but especially in the 15th chapter. Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam. The knowledge of the true nature of the supreme reality. Once again I repeat this. Jnanam. Knowledge. Of what? Bhagavat Tattvam. The true nature of the supreme reality. Whom we refer to as Brahman, Ishwaram, Bhagavan. All these different terms can be used. But what is actually refers to is the true nature of the Supreme Reality, Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam. And when we have this Jnanam, when we have this knowledge of the Supreme Reality, as it is, through experience, what is going to be the result of that? Phalam, Tat Phalam, Kim. What is its result? Moksham, Moktim. So in this 15th chapter, you will see that both these points have been beautifully placed before us. Bhagavat Tattva Gyanam and its result in the form of Moksha, Mukti. So the last verse of this 15th chapter says, in which Krishna says, beautifully he says, Ete guihyatamam shastram ida muktam mayanakha Etat buddhva buddhi mansyat krita krityascha bharata. What does it mean? 
says, Ite guihyatamam shastram. A beautiful term it is. Shastram but guihyatamam. Now what is the meaning of shastram? The shastra is a technical term. It has got a wide range of meanings. Shastra, to put it in a simple English language without going into the technicalities of it, what it means is the statement or the presentation of all the aspects of a certain subject. About a certain subject, when all the aspects of it is presented, that becomes the shastram of that subject. We have different kinds of shastras. We have Moksha Shastra, we have Yoga Shastra, you have Artha Shastra, you have Vastu Shastra, you have Natya Shastra. So these are all different subjects. Natya, Artha, Yoga, Vastu, these are all different subjects. But something which gives you all the aspects of a certain subject, then that becomes the Shastra of that subject. So Bhagavad Gita is the Shastra of what? Moksha Shastra. If you want to understand all the aspects of this great event which is supposed to happen in every human being's life, if we have to understand all the different facets of this great enterprise called self-realization, we need to study the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. They are the greatest works, truly speaking. There is absolutely no comparison with these two great sources of illumination. I would say they are the sources of illumination, literally sources of illumination. That they can literally illumine the human mind here itself, not after death, provided we fulfill certain conditions. So, Krishna says here, Guihyatamam Shastram. So Krishna has kept before us the Shastram, all the aspects of this subject of Moksha. And this Shastram is what? Guihyatamam, most secret. Now what is the meaning of being most secret? As I said, what is this Shastra dealing with? It is dealing with Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam the knowledge of the true nature of the supreme reality the knowledge of the true nature of the supreme reality i ask you is it literally speaking is it not a secret so what is the meaning of secret something which is not known to anyone is it not if something is known to everybody then that doesn't become secret secret means something which is not known which is hidden is not this Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam completely hidden? How many people in this world, in this creation, have the knowledge of the true nature of the self? Is it not? That's why it is Guihyatamam. It is not only Guihyam, it is Guihyatamam. It is the most secret thing in this creation. And that most secret Shastra is what Krishna presents to us in the 15th chapter. Krishna himself is saying, idam, that iti guihya tamam shastram, idam uktam maya, by me has been uttered or presented to the entire world through Arjuna, this most secret wisdom or knowledge, which is not known to anybody. And then what? Etat buddhva, anyone who knows this, or understands this as it should be understood, not our imaginary kind of some things, understanding it as it should be properly understood. So anyone who understands this, etat buddhva, buddhi mansyat, that person will become wise. And what? Kritakrityascha bharata, he will become kritakritya. Kritakritya is a beautiful term. What is the meaning of Krita Kritya? See, as a human being, the supreme purpose, the supreme goal, the supreme thing to be done in the human body is one and one alone. That is, 
striving to know the true nature of our own self. Once again I repeat, the supreme purpose of this human birth is nothing but striving to know the true nature of one's own self, which is Atman, which is Brahman, Ishwaram, whatever you may call, doesn't matter. But trying to know, striving to know the supreme true nature of our own self. This is the main purpose of human life. So when we do that, then we have done what we are supposed to do in this human birth. Krita Krityam. Krityam means Karaniyam. What we are supposed to do. Krita. Krita means we have done it. We have done what we are supposed to do. As a human being, being born in this human body, what we are supposed to do, that we have done. This is the greatest and the most important thing that we are supposed to do. So we all know how Sri Ramakrishna says in his beautiful Bengali language, he says, Manusya Jeevanir Ak Matro Deshu Ishwar Lak Bhagavan Lak The Ak Matro Deshu There is only one Udesha of this Manusya Janma and that is Ishwar Lab. Now, what is Ishwar Lab? Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam. Knowledge of the true nature of the Supreme Reality. That is what is Bhagavan Lab or Ishwar Lab. So, in this verse, Shankaracharya says, while commenting on this last verse of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna has said that, I have told you, the most secret Shastra, knowing which anyone who knows it will become wise and then he becomes Kritakritya. He has then done what he is supposed to do, being born in a human body. Now, while commenting on this verse, Bhagavan Shankaracharya says that although the whole of the Bhagavad Gita is a Shastra, now we have seen what is the meaning of Shastra. Shastra is that in which all the aspects of a certain subject is presented to us. So Bhagavad Gita, in its totality, it's a Shastra. It's a Moksha Shastra, in which all the aspects of this great event, or the great attainment of Moksha, has been discussed. Although Bhagavad Gita in its totality is a Shastra, Shankaracharya says, this 15th chapter independently is a Shastra. This 15th chapter independently in itself is a Shastra. Because in this single chapter, in these 20 verse, all the aspects of this great event of spiritual illumination resulting in moksha has been presented to us. So that is the speciality of this 15th chapter. Though Bhagavad Gita in itself is the Shastra, which presents to us all the facets and profiles of this great enterprise called Moksha, 15th chapter independently in itself is a Shastra. Because in the few 20 verses, Krishna presents to us in a very precise manner all the aspects of this great event of Moksha and liberation. Then Shankaracharya goes one step ahead and he says, what we find in 15th chapter, it is not only the essence of the whole of the Bhagavad Gita, that is also the essence of the entire Vedas. So you understand the importance of 15th chapter? That is the reason actually I thought, you know, what should I talk about? The best thing is to start from the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, which if we understand, we are actually speaking, understanding the whole of the purport of Vedas itself. All that the Vedic literature has to convey to the entire human race, that has been put here in the 15th chapter in the most precise manner and in fewest number of verses, just 20 verses. That is the beauty of this 15th chapter. That is why Gita, Bhagavan Krishna himself says, that iti guihyatamam shastram ida muktam maya. I have uttered 
तो गुई है तमाम शास्त्रों में दिस फिफ्टीन चैप्टर इन दिस वे हियर इन दिस लास्ट वर्स वी फाइंड द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ दिस फिफ्टीन चैप्टर बींग केप बिफोर अस एक्चुअली ऑल द ग्रेट मास्टर्स एंड द great spiritual personalities according to them i am just repeating what i have heard from them <clears throat> it is said that actually speaking bhagavad gita which has got 18 chapters in 15th chapter everything ends there is nothing more to be told in the first 15th chapter the whole of the bhagavad gita what krishna had to place before the whole world has come to an end in the 15th chapter so then what is the meaning of the 16th 17th and 18th chapter they are all just parishist just whatever has been left out something which has been broached in one of these 15 chapters but which was not elaborated that is what you find in the 16th 17th and the 18th chapter so it is uh, considered and it is uh, it is thought of that the true teaching of bhagwan shri krishna comes to an end with the 15th chapter which is referred to as purushottam yoga purushottam yoga where the true nature of the supreme reality is kept before us bhagavat tatva gyanam again this sanskrit words are so beautiful you know if you translate it into english you lose the magic you lose the power which it conveys bhagavat tatva gyanam and moksha phala this is what is conveyed to us in the 15th chapter <clears throat> now if this is the importance of the 15th chapter of the bhagavad gita now before going into the first verse of the 15th chapter in the bhagavad gita you will notice that every chapter very smoothly flows into the next chapter there is a continuous flow of ideas it is not just randomly something is going on you will see that anyone who has been a student of bhagavad gita will notice that ideas beautifully flow from the preceding chapter to the succeeding one it's a continuity of idea is there so where the 14th chapter ends there the 15th chapter takes off so the second last verse of the 14th chapter is very important 14th chapter what does it deal with the 14th chapter deals with the three gunas the 14th chapter is referred to as gunatraya vibhaga yoga the three gunas three gunas of what maya maha maya maya is trigunatmikam trigunatmika maya and how this entire world is nothing but maya srishti it is not vastavikam it is maya srishti we'll come to that point now and we are all under the clutches of this power of maya it's a strange power shakti it is brahman's own shakti it is atma's own shakti so beautifully presented by bhagwan shankaracharya in one of his masterly compositions called viveka chudamani those who have studied it they can study it so masterly he presents what this maya is he refers to this maya as paramesha shakti it is a power of atman atman's own shakti avyakta namni paramesha shakti anadiravyatya trigunatmika para karyanumeya sudhi eva maya yaya jagat sarvam idam prasuyate sannapya sannapyo bhayatmika no भिन्नाप्य भिन्नाप्यो भयात्मिकानु सांगाप्य नंगा ह्यो भयात्मिकानु महाद्भुतम अनिर्वचनीय रूपम दिस इज आई वोट गो इन टू द डिटेल्स ऑफ दैट वर्स इट इज द बेस्ट डेफिनेशन ऑफ माया एवर प्रेजेंटेड बाय एनी वन स्वामी विवेकानंद सीस द बेस्ट डेफिनेशन ऑफ माया वॉज गिवन बाय दिस ग्रेट मास्टर श्री शंकराचार्य वॉट मास्टरली इफ यू जस्ट गो इन टू इट इट इज सिंपली माइंड बॉकलिंग and you will see the more you think about that the more you will develop deepest devotion to that supreme reality it ends up in supreme devotion when you understand that at the 
base of this entire creation, there is one Shakti, Atman Shakti. And we have no other way apart from taking refuge at the feet of that Shakti. What an amazing thing it is. So anyhow, so in the second last verse of this 14th chapter, as I said, 14th chapter deals with this Gunatraya Vibhaga, the three Gunas, which go into the making of this entire samsara, and how we are all trapped in this three gunas. We are all the captives of the three gunas. There is no escape from this, as long as we don't become devoted to the Maya Dhish. If we have to go beyond the Maya, we have to take refuge at the feet of the Maya Dhish Ishwara. So that is the main essence of the second last verse of the 14th chapter where Krishna says, <clears throat> I'll just tell the gist of that verse. Before getting into the 15th chapter, this becomes the background to understand how Krishna beautifully takes us from one topic of discussion to the other topic of discussion. So in that second last verse, Krishna says, Mamcha yo avyabhicharena bhakti yogena sevate sagunan samatitya etan brahma bhuvyaya kalpate. Beautiful words. He says, Brahma bhuvyaya kalpate. Let us start from that standpoint. Brahma bhuvyaya. Brahma Bhūyāya means Brahma Bhavanāya. Shankaracharya says it is commentary. Brahma Bhavanāya means to become Brahman. Kalpate means you become fit. You become eligible to become Brahman. So, the whole topic of discussion is that we have to become Brahman. Now the question is, what do you mean by becoming Brahman? Are you not Brahman now? Even now we are Brahman. But we don't know that. It is not that we are actually going to become Brahman. It is not that we are not Brahman now and we are going to be become Brahman. No. So becoming Brahman doesn't mean that you are not Brahman and you are going to become Brahman. You are already Brahman. Not knowing it, it seems as if we are not Brahman. Because we don't know who we are, because we have no idea about our own true self, our true nature, it appears to us that as if we are not Brahman. That is why in that sense, Krishna talks about becoming Brahman. Brahma Bhūyāya, Brahma Bhavanāya, Kalpate. Kalpate means you, you become eligible. You acquire the fitness, Yogyata, to become Brahman. So beautiful. Shankaracharya in one of his, uh, in Bhridharanika Upanishad Bhashya, masterly com commentary, there Bhagavan Shankaracharya says, Prag Brahma Vigyana Dapis, Sarvo Jantu Brahmatvat, Sarva Bhava Pannasyat. Prag Brahma Vigyana Dapi. Even before the attainment of Brahma Vigyana, See, in the present state, we don't have the knowledge of Brahman. We are ignorant. Even when we are ignorant, Prag Brahma Vigyanadapi, Sarvo Jantu Brahmatvat. All the Jantus, Jantus means not only human beings, all the living creatures, they are all nothing but Brahman. Even before we attain the knowledge of one's own true self, we are all actually but Brahman and Brahman alone. That is the great truth, fact. Even now, when we are discussing this, our true nature, we have not deviated from our true nature even a bit. This is the great message of Vedanta. That's why this, even a little bit of conviction about this great fact, that in our true nature, we may not be knowing it, but in our true nature, we are absolutely pure. We are free. We are fully awakened. There is no darkness, darkness in us. There is no sin in us. There is no impurity in us. That is the great conviction which all the devotees should have. The implication of this idea that even now we are Brahman. 
That is the plain truth. It is owing to ignorance. Only because we don't know about it, it appears as if we are not Brahman. That is why then we talk about becoming Brahman. It is not that you are going to become Brahman and you are not Brahman now. That is not the idea. So in the 14th chapters, that second last verse, Krishna says, Brahma Bhūyāya Kalpati. You attain, you become eligible to become Brahman by knowing Brahman. When you know Brahman, you become Brahman. That's all. When you know Brahman, you become Brahman. Brahma with Brahmaiva Bhavati. Viridharana Kupanishad says, in Novara Brahman, not Viridharana Kupanishad, Munda Kupanishad says, Brahma with Brahmaiva Bhavati. One who knows Brahman, he becomes Brahman. It is not that literally he is going to become Brahman. He was Brahman even before knowing it. But not knowing it appeared as if he is not Brahman. That is the point. Now what gives us this eligibility to become Brahman or no Brahman? That is the main point in that verse. So Krishna says there, Mamchayo avyabhicharena bhakti yogena sevati Anyone, any person who serves Ishvara. Now see, it's a very important thing. Anyone who serves Ishvara or whose life is completely centered in Ishvara. Banchayo avyabhicharena bhakti yogena sevati. Avyabhicharena bhakti yogena. Avyabhichari bhakti. Bhakti, supreme love. Parama Prem, which Narada Bhakti Sutra talks about. That Parama Prem, the supreme love for what? For Ishvara. And how is the supreme love? It is Avyabhichari, unwavering, absolutely unswerving love for that Ishvara. With such love, any person, any devotee who serves Ishvara, what does it happen? Through such devotion, that person gains the eligibility to become Brahman by knowing Brahman. So that is the meaning of that second last verse of the 14th chapter. So see, how do we gain the Yogyata? See, often this is a pick. These are all, these are all connected with our spiritual life's central issues. People often come and ask this question. Why is that we are not succeeding in spiritual practice? Why? So many years of initiation has gone by. Nothing has happened. Nothing has happened. These are all the common points which everyone faces. We also, we, everyone goes through these stages. From that we can understand that something is actually obstructing this great attainment. We have perhaps somewhere, we have not gained that full yogyata. The yogyata to know the true nature of the Supreme Reality. Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam, if that Jnanam has to be attained, some Yogyata is expected. Without that eligibility, fa eligibility factor, no one can actually succeed in having the knowledge of this Bhagavat Tattva. So that eligibility comes when we lead a life full of devotion, what kind of a devotion? Avyabhichari. Unswerving, unwavering devotion for Ishwara. When we lead that kind of a life, slowly we gain. It is a slow and gradual process through which we gain the eligibility. All the impurities of the mind are slowly weakened and destroyed. That is what Krishna says. Sa gunan samatitya etan. He begins to transcend the gunas. Presently, we are all trapped in the three gunas. As we develop this kind of a devotion for Ishwara, slowly in and through that devotion, what happens is, slowly we loosen the grip of the gunas on our life. We begin to transcend it and we gain the eligibility to have Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam. Now see, now this idea is continued in the 15th chapter. I was just now, what I was discussing was the second last verse of the 14th chapter. 
So there's something called eligibility. Unless we gain that eligibility, unless we gain that yogyata, this Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam will not come into our life. So all of our spiritual sadhana that we do, all of our spiritual practices, they are all essentially meant, we are every day, whatever we are doing, all the devotees all over the world, all of our spiritual practices, like leading a more focused life, self-restraint and self-controlled life, turning away from the so-called, this unreal world, all these are the practices which slowly strengthens our eligibility and yogyata and slowly in course of time this bhagavat tattva jnanam becomes a reality now you see shankaracharya commenting upon the first verse not commenting upon the first verse introducing the first verse of the 15th chapter he says if this devotee who is devoted to this Ishvara in an unwavering manner, absolutely unwavering devotion, and in and through this devotion, he gains the eligibility and through that slowly he attains illumination. And through illumination, he attains the result or the fruit of this illumination, which is Mukti. If this can happen to this devotee, if this devotee attains mukti in and through this kind of unwavering devotion, then what to talk about that person who is already established in self-knowledge? What to talk about that person who is already the knower of the true nature of the Supreme Self? He will be living a life of freedom here itself. That's why Bhagavan Shankaracharya says, that Krishna here, the 15 chapters, main intention of Bhagavan Krishna is to present to us the Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam. The knowledge of the true nature of the Supreme Reality. The knowledge of the true nature of the Atman. The knowledge of the true nature of the Brahman. Because it is this knowledge which actually liberates us in life. So, that is the main topic here. Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam and along with that all the other related aspects and related topics are discussed here. <clears throat> so, introducing this first verse, Shankaracharya says that, I will read it from the Sanskrit here, <clears throat> he says, the 15th chapter of the Gita, the first three verses, in that we come across an imagery of a tree. An imagery of a tree. We all know there is a tree. The tree is born from a seed, is it not? From a root. Similarly, this entire samsara is compared to a vriksham, sansara vriksham. It's a beautiful graphic picturization of this entire Vishwa Prapancha this entire Brahmanda, which is like a tree, which is like a vriksham. And this samsara vriksham has come from a root. Now we need to understand this entire prapancha which we are experiencing. Actually our problem is this. We are totally confused about what we are dealing and handling every day. Again I repeat, we are absolutely confused about what we are handling and seeing and perceiving and experiencing every day. And owing to our indiscrimination, owing to this aviveka, we are actually misreading our experiences and owing to the misreading, we are mishandling our life situations. And instead of getting liberated, we become more and more bound in this samsara. That is the whole predicament of the human situation. So, Shankaracharya says there, what does he say? This vriksha rupa kalpana, 
Samsara Vriksha Rupa Kalpana, which Krishna presents here. Samsara Vriksha Rupa Kalpana. This imagery of the tree of the samsara. Why Krishna presents this? Now Krishna's intention is to give Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam. But Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam will not come unless it is preceded by one factor. One and only one factor. We'll come to that point. So beautiful. This Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam cannot come unless it is preceded by one factor. What is that factor? In order to make us understand that one factor, this imagery of the tree is being presented by Bhagavan Krishna right in the beginning of the 15th chapter. So, Shankaracharya says, Vriksha Rupa Kalpanaya. What is the reason that Shri Krishna presents this imagery of a tree? Why? Vairagya Heto. In order to awaken vairagya in us. Vairagya hetu. Shankarachar This vairagya has to come for the samsara. As long as we are not having this vairagya, there is no question of attaining Bhagavad Tattva Jnana. It is impossible. Impossible in its truest and literal sense. Literal sense. It is impossible this Bhagavat Tattva Jnana, Bhagavat Prapti, Ishwar Lab, whatever you may call, unless we develop this great virtue of Vairagya, Viraga, Vairagya means Viraga, opposite of Raga. Raga, is ma- raga, raga means what? Attachment. Attachment to what we are seeing, attachment to what we are experiencing. As long as we have this deep attachment to what we are experiencing through our sensory system, There is absolutely no chance of having this knowledge of the true nature of the Supreme Reality. It can never happen. So why this imagery of the tree? Vairagya Hetu. For the sake of for the sake of awakening little vairagyanas. It starts little bit and then we have to strengthen it. Slowly, slowly this vairagya has to be strengthened. Without this vairagya, There is absolutely no question of understanding what the Supreme Reality is. That is the point. So, Vairagya Hetu Sansara Rupam Varanayati The Sansara Rupam Varanayati, Shankaracharya says, the Sansara Rupam is being described. Why? Vairagya Hetu To instill the spirit of Vairagya and renunciation in all of us. Vairagya Hetu And what then he says? Viraktasya hi sansarat bhagavat tattva jnani adhikaro na anyasya. Beautiful thing. He says, Viraktasya hi. It is only one who is endowed with the spirit of vairagya and renunciation. Viraktasya hi sansarat bhagavat tattva jnani adhikaro. Bhagavat tattva jnana me adhikar kisko hai? Jiska man virakt hai. Usi ko bhagavat tattva jnana me usko adhikar prapt hota hai. Means yogyata, eligibility. What the second last verse of the 14th chapter talked about. Brahma bhūyāya kalpate. Brahma, bh- Brahma bhavanāya kalpate. You become fit to become Brahman by knowing Brahman. But what is that fitness? That fitness is this. Without this vairagya, for this samsara, we never shall have the eligibility, the yogyata to know the true nature of our own self. It is not possible. It never happens. So this is another reason why often, you know, we all come with such questions that nothing is happening in our life. So we need to think in these lines. Something is shot. Somewhere we are falling short. Where we are falling short, that is the thing which we have to focus upon. If we are really serious about our spiritual goal, that is why the scriptures become literally like a light. Scriptures are just like a lamp. It is no joke. They are literally, literally they are like a lamp. In a dark room, if you 
light a lamp, what happens? The darkness is dispelled. Similarly, the scriptures and the words of the great masters, they are like, literally like a light. They show us the way. They tell us that where you are falling short, my dear children, pay attention to that. And once you pay attention to that, you can fill in those gaps and you can proceed towards your spiritual goal. So, he says, Vairagya heto sansara rupam varnayati. The sansara vriksha has been described for what? Vairagya hetu. And viraktasya hi sansarat. Only a person who has turned away from this samsara. Very important point. Again, I repeat. Only, only means an only in double quotes. Only a person who has turned away from this mithya jagat. This anitya jagat. Only that person, bhagavat tattva jnane adhikaro na anyasya. Only that person becomes fit to have the knowledge of the true nature of the Supreme Reality. Because the knowledge of the Supreme Reality, knowledge of the true nature of the Supreme Reality, not our imaginary ideas, Supreme Reality as the Supreme Reality is, and that knowledge, experiential knowledge, can come only when we have vairagya for this samsara. As long as you take the samsara to be absolutely real and as long as we are busy running after it, deeply attached, deeply tied down to every single thing of this dimension, this changing dimension, there is absolutely no talk of liberation or the knowledge of the true nature of the supreme reality. It cannot happen. That's why Shankaracharya says, beautiful in Vivek Shudamani, Moksha se heto prathamo nigadyate vairagyam atyantam anitya vastushu. Prathamo nigadyate, the first thing I am going to enumerate, nigadyate, Moksha se hetu. What is the hetu of this moksha? Liberation? Vairagyam atyantam anitya vastushu. Anitya vastushu, vairagyam, not only vairagyam, not lukewarm vairagyam, atyanta vairagyam, anitya vastushu. See the words. Now you look, now you want to see the example of this? What is the example, the best example that we have here in the modern times? Sri Ramakrishna. All the great masters, they were the embodiments of this. There is nothing special about it about Sri Ramakrishna, but the most modern demonstration of this Vairagya, Tyag, blazing demonstration. What a demonstration! About whom Sri Sri Ma says, people talk about Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna came for harmony of religions and all those things. Sri Sri Ma says, see, I don't know all those things. But the most defining characteristic of Sri Ramakrishna's life and personality is what? Tyag, Vairagya. See what he is demonstrating. If we are the devotees of Sri Ramakrishna, we should remember, it is not the question of worshipping some form. Worshipping Sri Ramakrishna means going in, growing in the spirit of Vairagya and Tyaga. Then we are truly worshipping Sri Ramakrishna. If we are really worshipping Sri Ramakrishna, means if Sri Ramakrishna is going to become our Ishta, what does it mean? It is... Sri Ramakrishna stands as a role model for all those people who have taken Mantra Diksha and repeating Sri Ramakrishna's name. What is the meaning of that action of repeating his name? He stands for this greatest virtue of Viraga. Viraga means the opposite of Raga. Raga is what? Attachment. Viraga is opposite of attachment. No more attachment to this changing dimension which we are experiencing through our sensory system. So beautiful. So moksha se heto prathamo nigadyate vairagyam atyantam anitya vastushu. Atyanta vairagya for the anitya vastu. Now you see, just compare it with for all the devotees of Sri Ramakrishna. What do we find? 
Shri Ramakrishna Arati. The first three words. I always keep on, I don't tire telling this point. <laughs> the first three words sum up the whole thing. You don't have to repeat the other, the whole of the Arati. The first three words speaks everything. What is what does Sri Ramakrishna stand for? What is it? Why he is standing for an experience? He is standing for a phenomenon. What is that? Khandana bhava bandhana. So beautiful. It gives goosebumps. That is what here Sri Krishna is teaching. Mukti through Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam. That khandana bhava bandhana, which comes from Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam. The knowledge of the true nature of the supreme reality which liberates us. Knowledge of the true nature of our own true self which liberates us. Sri Ramakrishna stands for that. And what is the way? Vairagya Matyanta Anitya Vastushu. Extreme revulsion for this samsara. Sri Ramakrishna's Arati says, Vanchana Kama Kanchana. Ati nindita indriya rag. Is it not? Ati nindita indriya rag. Not just nindita indriya rag. Indriya rag, the attachment for indriya vishayas. Sri Ramakrishna has got not only ninda, but ati nindita indriya rag. Extreme hatred or aversion for indriya rag. It is in that state of mind one can have this Bhagavad Tattva Jnana. Now see what Krishna is saying, what Shankaracharya is saying, and if you want to see the demonstration of that, Sri Ramakrishna, so beautiful. What do we find in Sri Ramakrishna's life? That blazing demonstration of Vairakya. Literally speaking, what Sri Sri Ma has said, how true it is. Has the world ever seen this kind of Vairagya? Really, it's, it's a very important statement by Sri Sri Ma. What blazing... That is the one thing to be learned. Other things are all... Sri Ramakrishna's life, what we have to learn, the one message coming through Sri Ramakrishna to the entire human race is the message of Vairagya and Tyak. He stands for that. This entire world which is drowned in this samsara sagara on one side, there has to be an equally strong demonstration of the opposite of that. Where the whole world is drowned in this ocean of the samsara, to cure this disease which has gripped the entire humanity, there has to be a demonstration which is equally strong and opposite to this drowning into this ocean. And that opposite is what? Intense vairagya. On the one side, humanity is drowned in the samsara, on the opposite side, Sri Ramakrishna stands here, absolutely on the opposite side. With not the slightest trace of fascination or any kind of moha, the delusion for this samsara. So beautiful. Sri Ramakrishna, which stands for this Vairagya. So Shankaracharya says, so why is this imagery of the tree presented here? The reason for presenting this imagery of the tree is what? Vairagya hetu. Because viraktasya hi bhagvat tattva jnane adhikaraha na anyasya. It is only the person who is having this great virtue of vairagya. Only the person who has got this great spirit of tyaga. Only he becomes fit, yogya, adhikari, to have this bhagvat tattva jnana. Nanyasya, no one else, unless we have given up this moha. Moha for what? This change. Now that is what is the description, a beautiful description, the three verses. Hmm? The th those three verses, we shall take it up tomorrow. We have already, the time is over. So in short, what we have discussed today is just an introduction to the 15th chapter. The first verse we shall take tomorrow. Tomorrow means next Sunday. So the introduction in that, first of all, what we have seen is the supreme importance of the 15th chapter. The whole of Bhagavad Gita itself is a Shastra, but Krishna accords the 15th chapter itself with the status of being a Shastra. 
these 20 verses in itself is a complete Shastra because in this one chapter, the goal has been kept before us. The means to attain that goal has been kept before us. Who is a person who is eligible to embark on this great journey of self-illumination? That has been stated. The transmigration of this jiva has been shown to us how the jiva, owing to ignorance, he keeps on transmigrating from one body to the other and how it is happening. And it is this devotion to the supreme reality which ultimately, which is backed by, preceded by the spirit of Vairagya and Tyaga, it is these things which ultimately results in the attainment of that supreme reality through the knowledge, Jnanam of Bhagavat Tattva. This Bhagavat Tattva Jnanam is a beautiful word. Jnanam of what? Bhagavat Tattva. The true nature of the supreme reality, the knowledge of the true, true nature of supreme reality, which can never come unless we have cultivated this great virtue of Vairagya. And this Vairagya doesn't come unless we have Viveka. So ultimately you will find out this Viveka is the greatest virtue in spiritual life. We'll come to that point. Vivek, without Viveka, the spiritual life doesn't even take off. And what is Viveka? Nitya, Anitya, Vastu, Viveka. What is transient and what is permanent? Having a clear-cut understanding about it and turning away from the transient and or looking towards or seeking that which is permanent. This is the whole secret of spiritual life. So we stop here today. Hmm? Om Shanta Shanta Shanti Arihi Om Tatsat.